Good evening and welcome. For those who are just entering the theater, if you'll take a moment to silence your cell phones. Again, welcome to the 2022 VCU L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs Symposium, Racism, Health, and Accountability, presented tonight in partnership with VCU's University College and the Common Book Program. We want to take a moment before the program begins to thank our generous sponsors, our title sponsor, Dominion Energy. We have a number of Dominion Energy associates and leaders with us. Thank you again for your generous title sponsorship. And our three event sponsors, Altria, Elevents, and NASPA, the Network of Schools of Public Policy, Affairs, and Administration. We're also very grateful for our individual donors. Our fundraising timeline was short, but our goal was large. Over $100,000 and over 100 individual supporters. You all do deserve a round of applause. I'm very pleased to report that we have exceeded both goals with $130,000 raised and more than 110 individual gifts. Our $100,000 goal is symbolic of the 1972 case recounted in the Organ Thieves and the drastic reduction in available compensation. Your generosity is not only supporting tonight's symposium, but also establishing new scholarships for students who demonstrate a strong interest in elevating marginalized voices. If you would like to join us in our mission to do one better, there is a pledge card in the program, and there's also a QR code on the back of the program. We appreciate all of your donations large and small. And now to begin tonight's symposium discussion, we welcome Dr. Constance Relihan, Dean of the VCU University College. Dr. Relihan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Relihan, Dean of University College, and it is my delight to welcome everyone here, both in the auditorium and those online. This evening is being jointly sponsored by the Wilder School and by University College. University College is the home of VCU's Common Book Program. Every year, the Common Book Program selects a single book that addresses a difficult, complex, social issue that has broad impact on all of us and that can only be addressed through interdisciplinary thinking, honest and deep intellectual thought, and engaged civil discourse. The goal of the program is not to teach students what to think, but to help them learn how to think and to learn the value of the academic inquiry that they will undertake throughout their undergraduate education at VCU. Our common books are selected by a committee of faculty, staff, and students from across the university who come together to choose the common book from a list of texts suggested by the larger VCU community. I encourage everyone here to submit ideas for future book selections through our website, www.commonbook.vcu.edu. There you'll find also information about the expansive slate of programming that Carver Weekly, the acting director of the Common Book Program, and her team have coordinated for this year's book selection. This year's Common Book, The Organ Thieves, The Shocking Story of the First Heart Transplant in the Segregated South, is a powerful volume and it's made more powerful and important by the intimate connection between the events it describes and VCU's history. This award-winning book was written by Pulitzer-nominated journalist Chip Jones, a local Richmonder. For 30 years, nearly 30 years, Chip Jones has worked as a reporter for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, the Roanoke Times, 
the Virginia Business Magazine, and other publications. I am delighted to thank Mr. Jones for being present with us this evening. And I, I really want to thank him for the generous way in which he is participating in our Common Book program. I would also like to encourage everyone here to return to the Singleton Center on October 12th when Mr. Jones will deliver the 2022 Common Book keynote address. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Foda Sotoropoulos, who is VCU's Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Sotoropoulos. Thank you, Dean Relihan, and thank, thanks to all of you. It is my great honor to welcome you to this important symposium on a very painful part of our university's history. VCU President Michael Rao sends his deep regrets and asks that I read this letter on his behalf. Dear Governor Wilder, Dean Gooden, members of the VCU Board of Visitors and guests, I am sorry that I cannot be with you tonight as I'm chairing a national meeting of the Board of the American Council on Education. I wish I could join you all as you discuss the book Organ Thieves and the light it shines on past actions of VCU and the unimaginable failures in healthcare equity as well as the importance of further advancing equity in healthcare. 54 years ago, the Medical College of Virginia performed our institution's first heart transplant, but without the knowledge or consent of Mr. Bruce Tucker, a black man whose heart was taken and transplanted into a white man. It was a failure in so many respects that neither Mr. Tucker or his family was aware or given the opportunity to consent, showing a lack of respect and compassion, which must both be priorities in healthcare for everyone. MCV's history, unfortunately, includes systematic mistreatment of people and communities of color, including the discovery of human remains in the East Mar uh, Marshall Street well in 1994. At that time, VCU did not afford the remains the respect they deserve. The egregious ways in which Mr. Tucker and his family were treated is not the only episode of biased treatment and exploitation that black and other minority patients and communities experienced and were subjected to in the institution's problematic past. Today, we take relevant and appropriate action, informed and shaped by community voice, to redress these mistakes of the past and reflect the society VCU works to advance, one in which people of all diverse backgrounds and experiences are afforded the dignity and respect that their humanity deserves. Last week, the VCU Health Board of Directors and VCU's Board of Visitors adopted an official apology and agreed to commission a plaque in Mr. Tucker's honor. A plaque does not make up for the way Mr. Tucker was treated, of course, but it's a step forward in ensuring that the story is told and allows us to recognize his role in the early history of heart transplantation. VCU is working purposefully to build trust with all of our communities, trust that is essential to achieving our health equity goals and saving more lives. Events like this one tonight increase awareness of these past events and the repercussions today. I thank Governor Wilder and Dean Gooden for hosting tonight's event. Governor Wilder's effort, efforts in healthcare equity, including taking the Tucker family's case in an attempt to achieve justice, is just one aspect of his continuing legacy. In addition, the VCU Office of Health Equity <coughs> will host its first annual Racial Equity Symposium, exploring the connection of history and health equity on September 21st. We have also chosen Chip Jones's book about the transplanting of Mr. Tucker's heart, The Organ Thieves, as this year's VCU Common Book. Through the Common Book program, VCU students, faculty, staff, and community partners read a common text that deals with the biggest questions of our time looking at social issues through an interdisciplinary lens. We'll welcome 
Mr. Jones to campus next month to discuss his work, and I think he may be present here today. <laughs> Great to have you. Um, history can teach us powerful lessons when we are willing to listen. Our hope is to create a body of knowledge that generations to come can learn from and use to inform meaningful change. Sincerely, Michael Rao. I echo President Rao's comments and assure you that VCU and our Board of Visitors are indeed committed to acknowledging the university's history and moving forward with a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in both the academic and health settings. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize members of the VCU Board of Visitors who are here with us tonight, our Rector Ben Dendy and Dr. Clifton Pay. I also want to commend Dean Relihan, <coughs> the University College, and the Common Book Program team for the diligent work in making VCU's Common Book Program one of the very best in the country. Incidentally, each spring, the dean of the, of the university college asks the university provost to select the next common book from three finalists. I am immensely proud that Organ, Th Organ Thieves was my very first selection as VCU's provost. While the topic is extremely difficult, it provides our students with an unbelievable opportunity to interact with a man who changed history, one of the most important and influential political servants of our time, Governor L. Douglas Wilder. VCU's outstanding School of Government and Public Affairs proudly bears his name, and fittingly, after just 10 years as a standalone school, ranks among the top 15% nationally and first in Virginia for public affairs schools. It is the home to the Research Institute for Social Equity and the nationally recognized Commonwealth Pool, Paul. Leading the Wilder School is Dean and Professor Susan T. Gooden. Dr. Gooden is an internationally recognized expert on social equity and public policy and the author of five books and numerous articles. Among her many accolades and distinctions, I would like to point out that Dr. Gooden is the president of the Network of Schools of Public Policy, Affairs, and Administration. This is, by the way, the world's largest accrediting body for public affairs programs and she's an elected fellow of the congressionally chartered National Academy of Public Administration. Dean Gooden, may I ask you to join me on stage? Thank you. So, it is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the man who needs no introduction, but nevertheless, uh, I would like to share some uh, uh, remarks about Governor Douglas Wilder. His career in public service spans over 60 years and includes many historic milestones. Governor Wilder became the first African American to be elected governor in the US, leading the Commonwealth of Virginia from 1990 to 1994. As the Commonwealth's 66th governor, he was commended for his sound fiscal management and balancing the state budget during difficult economic times. Financial World Magazine ranked Virginia as the best managed state in the US for two consecutive years under his administration. Governor Wilder's commitment to service began when he served in the United States Army during the Korean War, where he earned the Bronze Star for heroism in ground combat. Prior to this time as governor, he served as lieutenant governor from 1986 to 1990 and as a state senator from 1969 to 1985, chairing committees on transportation, rehabilitation and social services, privileges and elections, the Virginia Advisory Legislative Council, and the Senate Steering Committee, which appoints committee members. Other legislative achievements include providing state health care coverage for sickle cell anemia patients, toughening penalties for capital murderers and prison escapees, and expanding low and moderate income housing. For eight years, he persisted in sponsoring legislation that eventually led to establishing a state holiday honoring Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., making Virginia the first state in the nation to have a legislative holiday for Dr. King. He was the driving force in appointing black judges to serve on the bench. 
persuaded to run for mayor in 2004, Governor Wilder received 80% of the vote and carried each of the city's nine council districts and every precinct in the city. He was sworn in as Richmond's first elected mayor in 2005 and served until 2009, making him the first African-American mayor elected by popular vote for all the, uh, from all the citizens of Richmond. During his term, Richmond made remarkable progress in his fight against crime, having its lowest rate in 27 years. Downtown economic development and neighborhood improvements were widespread, and financial management re reached a new level of scrutiny that served taxpayers well. An attorney by professor, profession, Governor Wilder gained recognition as a leading, leading criminal trial lawyer. He graduated from Howard University Law School in 1959, and later established the legal firm that became known as Wilder Gregory and Associates, one of the few minority-owned businesses in Virginia at the time. Prior to earning his JD, he graduated from Virginia Union University with a BS degree in chemistry and worked in the office of the chief medical examiner as a toxicology technician. At present, Governor Wilder is a distinguished professor at Virginia Commonwealth University's L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs, where he lectures and hosts symposia, including Race in Academia and the Triple Pandemic. He's also the author of Son of Virginia, A Lifetime, A Life in America's Political Arena, published by Lions Press. In recent years, he has served as the keynote speaker for the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission Report National Conference held at the University of Minnesota and the University of Richmond's Law Symposium, the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, past, present, and future. Governor Wilder continues to be a champion of people and causes. He's still a highly involved, highly dedicated citizen of the city and he, that he has called home for most of his life and one of its best and most outspoken ambassador. A previous recipient of the NAACP prestigious Spingarn, uh, Spingarn uh, Medal, he is also the driving force for establishing a national slavery museum in Virginia. Before I ask the governor to join us on stage, I would like to conclude my remarks by sharing my own a very important personal experience. I came to the United States as a first generation student from Greece in 1987 to pursue my graduate studies. I clearly remember reading by Gov about Governor Wilder's election as the first black governor of Virginia, of, of, uh, governor of Virginia, the very first in the United States. This story was inspirational and highly motivational for me. It gave me strength and courage to pursue through my career, as I'm sure he has done with his example uh, to, for countless people and he will continue to be doing uh, uh, for years ahead. Without any further, so for me, it's, a, it's a, uh, the honor of a lifetime to stand here and have the opportunity to welcome Governor Wilder to the stage. Governor Wilder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. I am um, pleased to be here with you. When I greet people on the streets, they say to me, how are you doing? I say, I woke up this morning. <laughs> and that's a great start. <clears throat> I want to say that, thank you, Dr. Fodorayev, the Stephanopoulos, over 50 years have passed since the Bruce Tucker heart transplant. In 1968, occasion at the Medical College of Virginia. Uh, this is being highlighted today by the common book selection, organ thieves, as has been pointed out. <clears> that Dean Relihan and her staff selected this book is commendable. And I also thank Dr. Kevin Allison for his part in organizing this event. The title of the book suggests what many of the jurors thought during the trial, as well as 
what the judge was wrestling with throughout as he consistently asked questions of the de defense attorney. The author, Chip Jones, called it as he saw what was factually reflected. And he and his wife are with us this evening, and we welcome them, are they? Where we would have them stand so we can recognize them. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Who were the organ thieves? Where did the theft occur? What did they steal? VCU, then MCV, never, ever made the slightest semblance of an apology or an acknowledgment of their participation in wrongdoing. Yet just a few days ago, I read something that said they were sorry it happened. I also read that they wanted the family of Bruce Tucker to provide help in designing a plaque in his honor. What words would they use to Bruce Tucker with thanks for your heart from the bottom of ours? <laughs> Should the plaque be shaped in heart form? I also read that they wanted to meet with the family now. But I read about this a few days ago with simple courtesy. And I appreciate all the nice things that were said to me, doctor, by you. But wouldn't simple courtesy and oh, some degree of respect allow VCU to notify the person they know to be most connected with that case more so than anyone else, me? Or did they have the same difficulty locating me right on this campus as they did locating the family of Bruce Tucker? The book, The Organ Thieves, was published two years ago. Dude, did you just find out about it? VCU? Did the leadership have to wait a few days before this event to show further disrespect, as I call it? I can only imagine what Abraham Tucker, son of Bruce Tucker, must be feeling at this public display of fake remorse. This symposium is designed to bring reality to the need for research and the improving of social equity. Questions arise as to what is being now, what is being done, not talked about. What is being done now to address the continuing issues of race and racism by the present leadership at VCU? What has the leadership at VCU demonstrated as an apology for this barbaric act of racism and the continuance that of what? I, I, I'll wait, but I'll be waiting in vain. Does it address the, does it meet with the gatherings of the black alumni at VCU to ascertain their concerns? Does it address the issues raised by the Black Education Association of VCU? to help them? The answer to both questions is no. As we pointed out at our last symposium in October 2018, why is there a 150% turnover in black faculty here at VCU? Why is VCU's recruiting of black students in Virginia at such low levels? Why does the Commonwealth of Virginia continue to allow the desecration of the oldest black church in Virginia, one of the oldest in the world at 14th and Broad Streets, first African Baptist church? My church, my father's church, 
his slave father's church, rather than to turn it over to Virginia Union University for proper preservation and historical purposes. The late Vice Rector of the Board of Visitors and my good friend, Tom Farrell, and I agreed that this was the right thing and would be the right thing to do. The president of VCU did not agree. It is still being defiled as we speak. Why are those responsible for the administration allowing tuition increasing increases despite the pleas of the students? And many of us heard them. One young lady spoke to the board with the president there, and provost in attendance, saying, you're raising tuition. I'm having the most difficult time getting one meal a day, much less, three a day. I can't cut it. I can't make it. Why am I bringing these issues forth at this time? Oh, Wilder, you ought to be happy. You know, you're here, we've got the school name for you, and we're saying all these nice things about you. And I never needed anybody to say nice things about me. And I don't feed on that. If I don't bring these issues forth now, if not now, when? I've been fortunate to have lived an enjoyable and a challenging life. And many are aware that I became the first black governor of any state in America. Unfortunately, there have only been two. As of this date, my good friend Deval Patrick in Massachusetts, we always were a little ahead of Massachusetts, I like to tell him that. <laughs> During Reconstruction, PBS Pinchback was appointed to fill the seat of the governor who was in peace, and he served for a little over a month. But I've also enjoyed any number of other firsts. I'm not bragging, I'm just stating fact. I was the first black lawyer in Virginia to be listed in Martin Dale Hubble's national rankings. In other words, to get in that book, somebody had to think you, had to, you, got, you could cut it. I thought I could. I was the first black member of the Virginia Trial Lawyers Association in Virginia. The first. I founded the first integrated law firm in Virginia. And I was the only black member founder of the Richmond Criminal Bar. Now I cite these things not out of vainglorious psyche, but to show personal advancement for me has always been connected to the advancement of those less fortunate. I don't think these things were occasioned because I was flamboyant, <laughs> as referenced in the book. I just might have been able to cut it. Bruce Tucker was among those whom I've always tried to be connected with, as our lives are inadvertently connected. When his brother William Tucker contacted me, my only thought was that I had no choice but to adhere to my inner callings, framed by the rich prodigality of parental guidance and upbringing and the commitment to the uplift of those less fortunate. Hopefully, we'll see the changing of minds and attitudes and the shaping of action consistent with the words for atonement and relative to misdeeds of the past and the present. The organ thieves might just be the catalyst to that end, let us never, ever stop demanding what is right and criticizing what is wrong. But first, as Socrates proclaimed, know thy right, then proceed. Hopefully, this symposium will blend itself into orchestration of that theme. I hope so. God bless you. Thank you so much, Governor. You have certainly, as always, set the stage and got us right to the core of the issues relative to racism and accountability, which is the focus of our discussion this evening. As we talk about the book, and I want to say we will be taking questions, 
uh, from the audience, so I think there are baskets here. If you have questions, to please submit them. We will get to them a, a bit later. And uh, we're also uh, know we're joined by several hundreds of folks uh, on live stream as well. But I wanted to set the stage for this a bit. Uh, May 25th, 1968. And I know the author talks about this was about five to six weeks after King had been assassinated at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis on April the 4th. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1968 had already passed, so many of the things that we think about in terms of Selma and Bloody Sunday, all of those things had already transpired. And even the Kerner Commission report that you and I talked about at the University of Minnesota on the 50th, 50th anniversary had been released in March, so we're now at the end. So when we come to this case, um, and I know some people have read the book and others may not have, but just to provide a little bit of an overview, there was a race, a heart transplant race that was going on that set the backdrop. Um, and of course, we know that um, surgeons in Cape Town, South Africa, were actually the first to have the first successful human heart transplant. Um, Bruce Tucker had hit his head, uh, went to the hospital at MCV, and was determined that there was no left, functioning left in his brain. As you mentioned, Governor Wilder, his brother, William Tucker, um, had no knowledge that his brother had died, had not consented to have his organs donated at all, but not only his heart, but both of his kidneys, as I understand it, were also transplanted without any permission from the family, despite the fact that the deceased, Bruce Tucker, had a card uh, on his person of his brother's uh, shoe shop, uh, William Tucker. So how did Bruce Tucker find out about this? It was uh, through the actions of Matt Jones, who was the funeral director. So when the his brother's body came, he um, shared with Bruce Tucker, shared with William Tucker that your brother is missing a heart and as well as his kidneys. So the Tucker family reached out to you, then uh, uh, an early practicing attorney in your mid-30s to get involved with this case uh, to represent the Tucker family. So, Governor, can you take us back to, you know, when you first got the call, when you first learned about the case, what was your reaction, and what made you decide to take on this case so early in your career? Well, thank you, Dean. The um, first thing that came to my mind was I had to, William, uh, William Tucker had a very deep, resonant voice, a very deep voice. And it would be frightening if you <laughs> listened to him. He was crippled, he walked with crutches. And he called, he wanted to make an appointment to see me, and he did, he came in. And he told me that uh, his brother didn't have heart in his body, was taken at VCU. I said, listen, man, I do not have time to fool around. <laughs> I gotta make a living. <laughs> and so what are you talking about? He said, no, the undertaker. Mike Jones called me from Stony Point to tell me that he, my brother didn't have a heart in his body. He said, I said, you gotta be joking. He said, no. He said, would you call him? I said, yeah, I'll call him. So I called him. And sure enough, he said, when, I don't know what happened, but when we got the body here for embalming purposes, there was no heart. I said, what? said there was no heart at all. And so I then went over it with William again, and he told me that he had been tipped off by somebody who worked at the hospital who said, unfortunately something has happened to your brother, he's dead, he's gone. Uh, we, we, we can't tell you what it was, can't tell you how it happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, it was something. When Mac Jones confirmed this, I just couldn't believe it. And as has been indicated, I worked in the chief medical examiner's office for two years. And that 
I was in toxicology, science of dealing with poisons, etc. I was familiar. I did all of the blood, drunk blood alcohol tests for the state of Virginia. We only had one office at the time. And I, I said, I, I know being a bit acquainted with what goes on in the medical examiner's office, and I know the law, and how could a man's heart be taken out of his body unless he was dead? If you took his heart, you must have killed him. And so I made arrangements to meet with Tucker further, and we talked. As you pointed out, lots of things were going on in 1968 with the riots in the streets relative to assassination. Things were going on relative to politics, uh, who could and who could not represent whom. I always thought that, and had thought up to that time, that the definition of death would be cessation of life functions, particularly the heart. And so I was dumbfounded, to, to say the least, and I knew there was nobody to write to. Who was I going to write to ask what happened? Who was going to tell me what happened? Consequently, I decided I would file a lawsuit, and that's what I did. Tucker had very little money at the time of this case, I was married, had three children, and at that time, I was the only breadwinner in the house. I didn't have any money. But I had enough money to start the case, and enough money to, as I call it, prosecute it, because I thought then that it was thievery. I thought then that it was racist, and uh, I think now that it was thievery and racist. Right. So when you were being introduced, the provost shared that you are a 1959 graduate of Howard Law School. Couldn't go to school in Virginia. Right. Exactly. And so you went to law school at Howard in Washington, right. D.C. Now, Howard has produced the finest of minds relative to uh, legal work. We think about a former Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, Oliver Hill, Spotswood Robinson, the list goes on, and of course, yourself, Governor Wilder. How did your education at Howard shape or impact your approach to the case? When Thurgood Marshall founded the law school, at Howard University at the direction of President Mordecai Johnson. It was with the understanding that these lawyers were to go into their communities, go back to your communities and provide the leadership, go back to your communities and give what is not there, give back the upward lifting, lifting, lifting and the light, open doors that have been closed and don't worry about money, that'll come. If you do your job, you'll be supported. And so that's it's stuck with those of us uh, to do that. When I finished law school, uh, I couldn't take, at the time when I took the bar, if, if, if you passed a bar in Virginia, it would be one black person a year, hmm. if you were lucky. <laughs> and I didn't have the money to go to a bar of use course, to take its course. But I was fortunate enough to spend the $15 that I was able to make it. There you go. My goodness, my <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have about 10 or $15. I was able to buy Dean Woodbridge's law notes <laughs> down in William and Mary. And I studied them assiduously. I would tell my then wife, uh, I would be babysitting my oldest daughter. <laughs> and I, I was living at home with my parents. And I would say to her, I can't take the bob at one time because I got to get a job. <laughs> so I have got to pass it. So 
When I did that and passed the bar, and being the only one to have done it at that time, I knew that I was able to cut it, but I also knew that I needed to learn more about what was going on. I knew I needed to learn from people, to know things from people, what people did, how they did it. And so our job at Howard was to go into the communities and help. I put a law office in Churchill that had never been a law office in Churchill, white or black. But I knew half the people that lived in Churchill, so I said it there. And so when I did this and came back, it was with the attitude toward helping those less fortunate. I was participated in several other cases of that kind. Mm -hmm. So if, if we talk about the, the case, and in the book, um, we see that there is a turning point in the case with Judge Compton in his instructions that he gave the jury. So you talked about under the definition of Virginia of death under Virginia law at that time was the cessation of life. But the defense counsel led by Jack Russell was advocating for the definition to also include the loss of all function of the brain to be added in. Right. Now, originally, Judge Compton's instructions to the jury were to go by and to abide by Virginia, Virginia law. law. But then he reversed himself on the last day of the trial. Why do you think that Judge Compton reversed his instructions to the jury? Well, I think he was torn between doing what he thought was right and doing what could be furthering of the definition. I think he knew that if there were going to be brain death is determining death, period, I think he knew that that wasn't the present law. Mm -hmm. And yet I think he wanted to keep the doors open to make certain that Virginia could at least be a part of contributing to that. During the trial, as the author has pointed out, it just so happened that all of the heart plant trans surgeons in the world were meeting at Virginia Commonwealth, MCV. It just so happened that people from Stanford and other places in California happened to be coming to Virginia for this meeting, which means all of these people were witnesses. Mm -hmm. I had no witness, not a single witness. What could I put that person on the stand to say? Nothing. And so I think Judge Compton, and he and I were relatively the same age, and we were starting out practice together. I've always respected him. Matter of fact, when I was sworn in as Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, I asked him to swear me, and he was most proud to do it. I went to his funeral. And so I know in his heart, <laughs> there we go again. <laughs> <laughs> He was torn. He was really torn. And I don't think he talked about it after that. He kept notes. But he never, ever talked about the case. I never talked about it much myself. Because I was besieged by the people and uh, some Japanese surgeons and others wanting to do something in that regard. And I didn't want to have anything to say that would guide them one way or the other, and I knew it wouldn't help Bruce Tucker. Mm -hmm. Right now, nothing has helped Bruce Tucker. Right now, nothing has helped Abraham Tucker. Nothing has helped the Tucker. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's very nice to, with this atonement, but that still bothers me. And I think that there are people who today recognize that as much as we advance in, the, in society, and as much as we do the kinds of things we do, unless we commit ourselves to re reading race and racism from our society, we're going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. So, yes, absolutely. 
Listen. So ultimately, we know that the jury came back and found for the defendants, not for the Tucker family. No, I don't think it went quite like that. Okay. The judge dismissed the case. The jury didn't return a verdict as mm. such. The judge would not allow the jury to deliberate. Mm. The author will bear that out. Isn't that right? Trial by jury, and the jury is not permitted to deliberate. Mm -hmm. I don't think too many people knew that. So the judge said, I'm going to dismiss the case mm -hmm. before it gets to the jury. Wow. For me, I'm sorry. Dismiss the case while the jury was deliberating. He further instructed the jury mm -hmm. in terms of what the, what the uh, definition of death would be. So what do you see to be the wins of the case? Um, how did the case, the, the case certainly had a profound impact. Um, how did the case, just the trying of the case itself and calling attention to the issue and the strength of your arguments, how did the case transform society? I don't think it did. I think we're still in the throes of change. We're still in the throes of trying to recognize what's going on. As I pointed out, and I know it not, would not be expected uh, for me to say the things I said earlier, but tell me what MCV has done in 50 years to show atonement. Not what I had done, not what society has done. You measure these things by the people who were interactors, perpetrators, people who were there to make differences. I know as a little kid, my family, as I said, we belonged to First African Baptist Church. There was a viaduct, there was a bridge that connected 14th Street to Jefferson Avenue, and the jail was underneath. So these trolley cars ran across that bridge my brother and I, we had, my family, my father said, I was going to Armstrong High School at Prentice and Lee Streets. He said, one way transportation, you walk one way, you ride the other. So we had to walk from Church Hill to Prentice and Lee every day all, away from there. But my mother would say, don't you stay too late, don't you ever go out at night, and don't you ever go anywhere near 14th and and Broad Streets, or anywhere from 14th and Marshall Streets. And the older folks would say to those of us in the community, don't go out there. And they would say it this way, the student doctors will get you. Mm. And that was known through the community. I didn't make this up. And so the concern in answering your question, where do we stand, where we stand is one thing. Where those who have been involved stand is something else. For instance, uh, my father, mother, and father both were slaves. But his brother went on to become a medical doctor himself. The deal was that we help each other. He was to help my father go to law school. But unfortunately, he died at a young age, 32 years old. And my father was very embittered, he wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what has happened, by me saying these kinds of things relative to MCV and VCU now, is to make certain that the board discusses it. It makes certain that those people who are called upon to represent the taxpayers recognize that something needs to be done. We are not satisfied with what's going on. Governors need to be changing things the people need to be changing things. The elected officials need to be changing things. That's why the people are so important, because they are always ahead of the leaders, mm -hmm. always. Well said. So Bruce Tucker and his family obviously gave a lot. They paid a high price. What have they received? My services, all that I could give them, and everything else that I could do. 
you'll have to ask those at MCV, what have they given? And I'm quite certain they'll tell you. Absolutely no thing called nothing. So this symposium is about accountability. What should VCU do now to take more accountability? I think it's still in the hands of the people. The people will be looking for VCU to do something. And they are looking to VCU to do what is right. If they don't, then it's still in the hands of the people. Because the people, VCU belongs to the people. The people of Virginia. Not a dime can be spent unless it is approved by those who are elected to approve it by the people of Virginia. And that's why it's not a single burden to bear. It's the burden to be borne by the leaders. And the people are always ahead of the leaders. Mm -hmm. So the book's author, Chip Jones, and then we'll take a few questions, um, writes that you said, quote, at the end of the trial, uh, it's awfully difficult to fly in the face of the system in a conversation that you had with William Tucker as you left the courtroom. But when we look back over your career, Governor Wilder, it seems that you have spent a lifetime, over 60 years, flying in the face of the system. When I think back to your election in 1969 and your first Senate speech on the Senate floor being to get rid of the song, the Virginia song, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. And people said at the time, hey, you just got to the Senate. Who do you think you are? First African-American to be elected since Reconstruction. This is far too controversial. You'll never survive. But of course, you went on to become uh, governor. And even when you became governor, folks said, this will happen when hell freezes over. And there's the book now, When Hell Froze. <laughs> so... <laughs> So we all owe you uh, 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 a debt that cannot be paid in terms of your service to Virginia and the United States, but you've flown in the face of the system and had many uh, victories. How do you characterize uh, what are some of the most effective strategies in terms of taking on a system? Well, nothing is ever accomplished by an individual. I never accomplished anything singularly or by myself. As you pointed out, I was sent to Korea to fight for the freedoms of Koreans. And while I remember so vividly when I first landed in Korea, we went before the battalion commander, a man named Akov, who ultimately became the commander superintendent at VMI. And he told us, he said, uh, I want you to serve here and do whatever it is you need to do as it relates to what you're going to be called upon. He said, if you run into difficulties, you let me know. Don't you try to handle it. And you do your part, and I'll do mine. Well, got to Korea. All of the promotions were going to the white guys. Uh, people that I had trained were made corporal and sergeants, et cetera, et cetera. And so we started grousing, grousing about it, getting upset about it, being mad about it. And uh, so we met. I had a sergeant who told me, he said, let's get the guys together. We marched down to see the colonel since he told us about this. Major Hercoff, he was major then. Since he told us this, let's march him down. We put on steel pot helmets, two battalions of ammunition. Bayonets got them all together. We marched down, and everybody the night before was telling everything in the world that had happened to them. So we got to the major. The major was so shook to see us there. And we marched everybody, and all of us black, <laughs> steel pot helmets, and armed to the teeth. <laughs> said, good God, have mercy. What is going on? So we got there, and uh, I told the guys, I said, now go ahead and tell the major what you know, we were talking about last night. Would you tell the major what we talked about last night? My God, man, talk. They 
wasn't saying anything too much. I said, well, Major, let me just tell you this, and I went on to tell him what I had to say. Once I started, they took it over, too. They started talking. The Major said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. You go back to your outfits. You do what I told you to do at first. You do your part. I'm going to do mine. Within 30 days, promotion started taking place. He did his part. He was saying, I'm not going to preside over what the law says should be done, and it's wrong. So when you ask me the things that I did, very little comes by individual pursuit. People work and help each other, and I was helped by so many other people. I was given inspiration at that time that if I believed in the system, the system could work, and we could make it work. Mm -hmm. Great. Well said. Well, we'll now turn to some questions, and um, I know that we'll, uh, there are several questions from the audience, but we allowed students as part of the Commonwealth um, Book Club uh, to, uh, to also share with uh, us some questions. So the first question is a personal one, and it says, how significant, Governor Wilder, was this case to your own practice and career, and how did people in Richmond respond after the result? Well, the people look to leadership, and unfortunately, sometimes we believe that there's collative effort in, in terms of black people working together, whites working against you. Uh, I ran for office, uh, state senate, uh, as you pointed out. Uh, I was not supported by the leadership of the black community at that time. I didn't pay any attention to it because I was supported by the people, mm -hmm. and I knew the people wanted me. You talk about the state song, carry me back to old Virginia, that's where this old dark is hot and long to go. We were called upon to sing that, stand up and sing it in the state legislature mm -hmm. of all places around the state, every time you had a gathering of people. And so when I said what I had to say about it, you'd be surprised at some of the people that said, we didn't send him down there to talk about some song. They didn't send me anywhere because they didn't even live <laughs> where I was elected. <laughs> I would get it passed in the Senate, and the House would kill it. I would get the bill passed in the House, and the Senate, the governor vetoed it. It had two governor's vetoes on it. And I finally, eventually got it passed. But let me tell you, in getting it passed, people who voted against it turned around and started voting for it, started being patrons on the bill. So I got a whole lot of credit for things that I've done, but I've never done anything by myself. Mm -hmm. I've always had help from a whole bunch of people some that I never even had the had opportunity to thank. So it's a collective thing, it's a people thing. I've always thought the people of Virginia were better than that, as I think the people of Virginia were better than what happened to Bruce Tucker in 1954. Mm -hmm. okay. Another question um, that we have from another student is, in your view, was there any shared liability that might have been placed upon the police department for its failure to locate the family of Mr. Tucker? I never thought of it that way. I thought that they did what usually you do. You get an address, you go to it. Um, they weren't participating in the removal of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't even know why he, perhaps he was being contacted. And so they said, well, it was something I never put any blame on the police. I put the blame where it belonged, the people who took the heart, mm -hmm. because they knew exactly what they were going to be doing. And um, it was unfortunate, but no, I don't blame the police. Okay. Right. Another question uh, a student asked, how does race and ethnicity play, how did it play a role in the case and in complex ethical issues? Well, I never read of anybody taking a white heart. <laughs> <laughs> and not contacting 
<laughs> the people that need to be contacted. I stand to be corrected, but I wait for them to correct it. Uh, the bones that were found, disconnected, no one knew whose bodies they were, who they belonged to. Uh, I, I think some of those bones may have been white bones, but they may have been, unfortunately, not a part of the system. And as you and I have talked about on so many occasions, uh, power and money is power. And uh, I think it's very unfortunate that that continues so to be the case. Mm -hmm. So another student asked, one of the most egregious aspects of this case seems to be that MCV never notified the Tucker family, even after his death. Um, did the defense ever offer a reason or rationale for this failure? The, the defense. Offered? The defense. No. Why do you have to do that? After all, he was a black man. Mm -hmm. At the time, and the author points it out, you're lucky to have a black person in the jury. If you've got one black person in your jury, you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Why would you strike him? Strike him because he's black. You don't have to tell him. Tell him about it because you have three what you call peremptory strikes. As a lawyer, each side has three. And uh, in criminal matters and civil matters, it's less. You have to give no reason at all. But when you found a jury that had one black person in it, you were lucky. And so it, it was the system. And it was that system that has been changed that allowed me to become elected, that allowed others to become elected. Changes to be made. Uh, right here at VCU, you are being a dean uh, at the school of what? Government and public affairs. Now that's dealing with it, that's cutting it. And that's letting people know that we are going to be a part of the mix one way or the other. And uh, the jury in this instance, they had no play in it at all. They had nothing at all to do with the outcome, the final outcome of this case. Mm -hmm. Another question we have, um, so this case was the first wrongful death lawsuit over a heart transplant in the nation, perhaps even the world. Wondering if you could comment on the 24-hour rule. Apparently the ha ha Harvard University Ad Hoc Committee on Brain Death called for retesting a patient 24 hours following any test that shows a patient's brain has died, but that did not happen. Why was that not followed and why was that not uh, considered? My thinking was that it would not further the purposes of what was intended. And that was that they needed a heart. Would you think somebody was going to do a 24 hour <laughs> rerun? <laughs> no, guess what, we got one. <laughs> let's start it, let's get it did. <laughs> and so I know it sounds harsh for me to say this now in terms of not being kinder. I'm not speaking to the current administration at VCU as to what happened then. What I'm saying and charging the current administration with is understanding that there has been that participation in wrong by VCU. And to that extent, there's an overburden of responsibility to correct it by showing that there's something more than just help us draft a plank for Bruce Tucker's honor. Mm -hmm. It's insulting. And so when you ask the questions, you, all you got to do is go back to number one. The fault was and is with VCU, then MCV. That church was sold by First African Baptist Church. My father was a trustee and a deacon. My mother told him, said, Robert, don't sell, y'all shouldn't sell that church. Well, everybody was, black people moving to the north side. The population of Churchill was diminishing. Bottom was diminishing. And Dr. Sanger was president of the MCV at the time and bought the church for well less than $100,000. But in buying that church, that was the entire block up from Marshall Street to Broad Street. 
because the present location of the Master Center, that was our property. Mm -hmm. That whole block. So what MCV got was the block, and as I point out now, it's being desecrated. If you go in there, it's not for memorial purposes, and yet you look at everybody else's clinging to the memories of the past. What about our past? Mm -hmm. Well said. So we have other questions, I think, from the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, um, wow, these are some long questions. <laughs> okay, this is an interesting one. Governor Wilder, what is your own evaluation of Mr. Jones' book as a whole, The Organ Thieves? Did it omit anything crucial from your perspective or get anything wrong? What did it do especially well? I thought it was a good book. Uh, I think it is a good book. And I think the author did it in a fashion to be factual and to project what was and what is uh, to be determined from what took place. I was fascinated by the title, The Organ Thieves. <laughs> to, to even say that, <laughs> you have concluded that Something was stolen. And what was it, as I said earlier? I think one of the things I liked about what the author did likewise was to capture the notes that were written by Judge Compton. Fascinating insight in terms of what taking place. And I know that in many instances, uh, no one could know what was going on the judge didn't talk about it either. He would never talk about it. He wouldn't be interviewed. I didn't. And so it's been about a 50 plus year mystery about the first heart transplant case, but it was orchestrated mm -hmm. uh, by the people who had the authority so to do. And unfortunately, there was only one verdict they could arrive at after the judge's dismissal of the, uh, of the case. So we have a question about that. Uh, someone asked, was the judge's decision to dismiss the case, do you consider that to be legal at that time? Oh, it was, oh you mean at the time? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the money for appeal, and I, don't, I wouldn't have wanted it on appeal anyway. Uh, why, why not? Why do you say you wouldn't have The wanted? system was still in place, mm -hmm. and there's some very good people on the bench. I'm not calling anybody anything. But I wouldn't have wanted it on appeal. <laughs> and I, I can say also that uh, it just militated against progress. Uh, baby steps, short steps at a time. But the book was well written, well, well chronicled, and uh, didn't cut anybody any favors or do anything other than tell it like it is. And uh, he's to be commended for it. I think it's a good book. <laughs> So, Governor, an audience member asked, um, now looking forward, if you compare the legal system uh, then and now, what are areas of progress and in what ways are things still the same? Well, at the time, lawyers couldn't advertise. Uh, now they can. I think it's bad. I don't think they should be prohibited from not organizing. <laughs> not organizing or advertising. But you, we could always identify people, doctors, lawyers, dentists, who were there for the people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my law practice to be like that as well. I wanted to be there for the people. I wanted them to be able to, no appointment, walk in and be served, and they did. So the, the last part of the question was... Uh, oh, about what did you, what, what things are, how, how what has been the progress in the legal system and in what ways I has it changed? I think there's been progress in terms of specializing in uh, various things. Uh, but I do think that it's, 
And I don't criticize anybody for wanting to make a living. But if your profession is driven by just how much money you make, mm -hmm. it stops being a profession and it turns to be a business. And I would like to see more professionalism in the law uh, than the business aspect, knowing that everybody's got to eat and feed the families. But let's let the professionalism, I think, rise to a higher level. Mm -hmm. I'll see it. Another question, do you have any particular strategies with the jury knowing that they were all white? No. <laughs> I never looked at jurors as black or white, uh, male or female. And I wanted to be able to look into the jurors. When I would try cases with the jury, I would always look at their faces and watch what they were listening to. When I'm not talking, when, when you're talking, if you're the lawyer on the other side, I'm looking to see what catches them, what grabs their attention. And jurors are smarter than people give them credit for. They, uh, they're people. They, they have common experiences. And I've always liked to have people in my jury that were just ordinary people. So to the extent that they were made up of all white, it didn't make a difference to me. Because you can't, and I really do believe this, you can't judge people by the color of their skin. I can't judge whites by the color of their skin, nor can whites judge me by the color of mine. I think we, as King would say, let the content of character rise above it. Mm -hmm. The book concludes that the Tucker case had a profound impact on the definition of death going forward. Was that a win? It was inevitable. I, I, I don't know if anybody won, but it was inevitable that, he, that we would get to this uh, point. Um, you, you, uh, you see certain things in animal life recapitulated, but brain death was ultimately going to be there anyway. And uh, that we are here at this level isn't surprising, but there are so many other things that contribute to the lack of proper medical care today, proper health care, proper uh, diets, and people who need the kinds of help that they could have and should have. And I think medical profession has done well. We have a question about the medical profession. Um, dignity in life and death often is measured by one's pedigree, wealth, and it seems such still affects delivery of health care on an equitable manner. What do you recommend each of us do to improve equitable access to health care today? Demand what's right, criticize what's wrong, particularly those in the legislature, particularly those in government, those who are responsible for this for the dispensation. If I'm going to give you X amount of dollars for what you're doing, what are you doing with it? Your program is a perfect answer to it. RISE, Research Institute for Social Equity. Mm -hmm. And for that to take place embraces the very all of the things we're talking about here today. That's why you're to be commended and the others for selecting the book and to having this symposium. Because nobody likes to talk about race. We've got racial pimps, and we know that. We've got racial, uh, what I would call, uh, zealots, uh, people who really do believe that one race is superior to the other. But the biggest race that I like to talk about is the human race, without regard to color, without regard to gender. The human race, human beings. What are we as human beings doing to make our lives better? The more we concentrate on that, the better. Mm -hmm. Before a single witness was called, the judge lowered the damage award by 90% from 1 million to 100,000. Can you comment on how that came to be and what was your assessment of that decision on the impact of the trial? Well, I think he had a rather convoluted mechanism to arrive at that 
and I think he was big about you know the wrongful death statutes have been changing in Virginia for some time. They started off it was twenty five thousand dollars, then it was thirty five thousand, and it got to forty five thousand. I think now it's unlimited in terms of where it goes, and I think he was more guided by what the limits were uh, as it relates to how much could it, the jury uh, bring back. It, determined by the wrongful death statute rather than uh, personal injury. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. More questions. Okay. You just shared that back then you believed that you can change the system by coming together. Do you still believe this to be true or is it too entrenched with racism? Oh no, I still believe it. Uh, you can't ever stop believing. You, you, the high possibility, and this is what we were taught at Howard University by Mordecai Johnson, the president. He would speak too long, too many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he would speak a commencement for an hour and a half. And he said, my wife told me to not speak too long. She must, you must not have heard him. <laughs> But, but he, his theme was the high possibility of the individual. And he never, never, ever believed that there was not something good in people and that it was our responsibility as human beings and humankind to work to bring that about to the extent that people were less educated, lend our talents to help them to the extent that they don't have the access to the kinds of things that some of us would have help in that regard as well. But you, you've also got to remember, you've got to encourage people to have uplift. You've got to encourage them to believe in themselves. You cannot allow people to believe that boys, boys, all of us go catch hell. And I used to hear that so much as a kid. Well, what are you talking about? I don't know what you My mother would say, listen, pay those people no mind. Don't even fool around with them because there'll always be those who will say you can't and you cannot. And that's why I, I, I'm very fortunate to believe in people and not colors of people, as I say. And some of my, I hate to say it like this, some of the best friends I've had were not of my color. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop me from believing the high possibility of the individual. So uh, one of Tucker's descendants is still alive, Abraham Tucker. Does VCU owe him reparations? Well, I put it this way. If you steal something <laughs> that doesn't belong to you, and you are caught doing that, if a judge were deciding the issue, the judge would say, then why should I not hold you further guilty? What do you propose to do? Can you give that back what you stole? Oh no, I, I can't do it because I, I, it's gone. Well, can you get the value of that back? Uh, well, I don't have, I don't, I don't have, well, what can you do? And so I think the burden is on VCU right now to determine what it is they feel they can do. No, I'm not going to tell them what they need to do. I'm not going to say to them what they should do. I think they need to say to not just the Tucker family, but the taxpayers of Virginia. Is it more important to have 13 new soccer fields? Is it more important to have a coliseum? Is it more important to have a new baseball or football field? Isn't somewhere in between there some obligation? to at least reach out or to ask 
or to inquire of someone as to how do you think we can best go about making reconciliation in this instance. I think one of the first things to do is not to lament the fact that it happened, but to make amends for it demonstrably. Mm -hmm. And that means the, that jury is still out. Mm -hmm. well, I think we have time for uh, one final question. And this question really asks about your um, reflection on the Tucker case now, more than 50 years later. Where does this case rank in terms of the cases that you tried? Did you find this to be the most difficult, the most challenging? When you think back to this case today, what do you think? Well, it was know, one of the most celebrated cases, but you know, I've had some... I've had some tough cases. I've had uh, some criminal cases. I, I don't even want to talk about it. I see my good friend Walter McFarland sitting over there. And he was my lawyer when I was the governor. <laughs> and he can tell you that death penalty cases that would come up. And for me to have to pass judgment as to whether the verdicts should be carried for. And the only two people that talked about that were he and I. And that, there's some very, that to me was one of the more difficult times that I've had as a governor or as an individual, passing judgment on someone's life. That was what happened with VCU. They passed judgment on Bruce Tucker's life whether it was premature or not, that jury is still out. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you so much, Governor. You have provided remarkable insights and wisdom, not only into this case, but to issues of equity and fairness for all time. Well, let me thank all of you for being here, and particularly the students, and those of you continuing to support our Splendid Dean, as she points out, we travel a lot. My good friend, the rector, Ben Dent, is here. And the things that I say critical of VCU are heartfelt, but not mean-spirited. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we could talk, work, and blend together in orchestration to fulfillment of the uplift is what I'm more interested in than anything else. Thank you for being here, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much, Governor. <laughs>